Well, good morning again, and uh, may I welcome the Minister for Energy, Connectivity in the Islands, Paul Wheelhouse, and also Stuart Matheson, who is the Senior Policy Advisor on Electricity Networks and Regulation from the Scottish Government. Uh, we now turn to look at the Renewables Obligations Scotland Amendment Order 2018, and I'll invite the Minister to make his opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, and can I also thank you and the committee members and indeed your clerks for allowing me the flexibility to appear late in your session today. I appreciate you've had a long session today, so I'm grateful for uh, your forbearance. The order before committee um, will, if approved, result in a minor amendment to the Renewable Obligation Scotland Order 2009. And uh, before turning to the amendment itself, it might be helpful just to provide a little bit of background or, uh, to the Renewable Obligation Order itself. There are three uh, renewable ob obligation orders, with one covering England and Wales, uh, another for Northern Ireland, and of course one for, for Scotland. These orders place an obligation uh, on UK electricity suppliers to source an increasing proportion of the electricity supplied by them from renewable sources. Renewable obligation certificates, or ROCs for short, are awarded to eligible renewable generators in respect of the output that they generate. Suppliers can then buy these rocks and use them to demonstrate that they have met their obligation uh, or they can pay a fixed sum into a buyout fund for each rock or Scottish rock, uh, rock uh, they either can't or choose not to present. The obligation, as intended, has provided a hugely effective incentive for renewable generators, with capacity across Scotland having reached 10.3 gigawatts as at the end of quarter uh, two of uh, this year. Indeed, the final figures for 2017 show that renewable generation supplied the equivalent of 69% of Scotland's electricity consumption, a record high level, slightly higher than the figure that's quoted in the, uh, uh, in the document itself, because since then we've had updated base figures. Uh, successive Scottish governments have largely maintained an approach consistent with the other UK obligations. However, there have been important exemptions, exceptions sorry, where we have tailored the Scottish obligation to better reflect Scotland's particular needs and priorities. For example, in April 2009, we introduced enhanced rock bans for wave and tidal projects in Scotland. And in April 2014, we introduced two, two new uh, enhanced rock bans to provide uh, additional support for innovative offshore wind projects in Scotland. The committee uh, will recall that these devolved powers were curtailed by the 2013 Energy Act. The, the contracts for difference uh, mechanism has now replaced the renewable obligation as a means of supporting new re renewable capacity. However, uh, although the obligations across Great Britain were closed to new capacity from April of last year, they will continue to run until 2037 for eligible projects. The order itself, uh, I'll now turn to, uh, will move uh, to the content of, of that uh, for the committee. When the UK renewables obligations were closed in March 2017, changes were introduced which allowed generators to add capacity at accredited sites. And this additional capacity would not be eligible for SROCs, uh, but nor would it uh, affect the eligibility of the existing capacity at these sites. However, Article 17.4 uh, with, within the uh, Renewable Obligation Scotland Order 2009 has the effect of preventing any accredited hydro stations from adding capacity where that takes the declared net capacity of any such station above 20 megawatts. Our amending order will rectify that. It will allow hydro generating stations in Scotland to add extra renewable capacity while retaining their eligibility for uh, Scottish rocks only uh, from the originally accredited capacity at their site. This will allow any generators who choose to do so to increase their renewable capacity and production without creating any additional costs for consumers. Uh, it will also bring hydro generating stations in line with all other technologies and thus allow them to compete on a level playing field. Uh, in conclusion, convener, we expect that this order is likely to have limited application since it will only be of relevance to hydro generating stations which were accredited before 2002 and which have, ha have the ability to increase their declared net capacity above 20 megawatts. However, uh, although its impact may be modest, it nonetheless provides a means to encourage additional renewable electricity generation in Scotland, and I believe it's an equitable and sensible amendment. Uh, but before I, I formally move to uh, the motion re recommending the order, I'd of course be happy to uh, respond to any questions that you or your fellow committee members have, Convener. Are there any questions from committee members? Andy Whiteman. <coughs> um, we've received some evidence from SSE um, who um, are responsible for the vast, the vast majority of the power schemes that have downgraded from a capacity um, exceeding 20 megawatts. My understanding is the SSE have sold all its hydro assets to Drax. 
Uh, Scot Scottish Power have sold their assets. Uh, SSC Sorry. still retain them. Uh, ah, so, okay. Yeah. Sorry, apologies. Got it wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what what is what is your you, you you've come up with scenarios, low central and high scenarios, about the likely impact on generation. What are the kind of factors that will influence that? I, I think, um, in fairness, Mr Whiteman has raised a, a fair point. SSC, we think, are unlikely at this stage to make amendments to their seven sites out of the eight that uh, yeah. have had their capacity uh, curtailed as part of the uh, impact of the previous policy position. Um, we do believe that uh, one other developer, uh, Symec, who have the Kinloch Leaven uh, hydro scheme, uh, which is serving the, uh, Al the former Alcan smelter, Liberty, now own uh, at, at uh, Loch Aber, uh, will potentially do this. Um, and the factors that will play into this, uh, Ofgem have made a point that in order for this to be compliant, they will need to be either separate metering um, to f fully record and make sure there's not an overclaim on, on the uh, rocks, or alternatively, they will pro rata allocate over the total production from the site um, uh, revenue through rocks to to that which is that part that component which or proportion which is eligible to receive rocks. That may um, the, individually the developers will have to take a judgment as to whether that leaves them in a better or worse position. Uh, and so uh, it's, it'll be down to a, a commercial decision on the part of CIMEC as to whether they go ahead with, with this uh, in, in Kinloch Leaven. But at least by removing this barrier, it allows them to make that decision and to potentially take it forward if they believe it's the right thing to do. And similarly, SSE haven't ruled out doing it at some point in the future, uh, but at this stage they've indicated to us they're not likely to proceed. So we think the, the overall impact will be modest, potentially an additional 10 megawatts of uh, hydro capacity at Kinloch Leaven. Uh, if all sites were to, to go down the route of um, uh, reinstating the original capacity, that would be an additional 55 megawatts of uh, hydro generating capacity that would be added, but with no additional cost to consumers. And that's an important point um, that, uh, you know, that that will be the case. So the, bot the bottom line is that this um, order is removing a barrier. Yes. Uh, but it's up to obviously the private generators to d decide whether they wish to take advantage of that or not. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Whiteman is absolutely correct about that. Thank you. Right. Um, Jamie Halcor Johnson. Sorry, just very I appreciate this is about hydro hydro schemes. Uh, is there any is there any likelihood or any chance that this could have any impact on constraint payments in the onshore wind uh, sector? Um, we don't believe so, but that's a clearly an important point in terms of the capacity that's on the grid and at lo localised uh, level. Uh, and clearly, um, there has been some discussion around the uh, increased capacity needed at Loch Aber to allow any increased capacity in the hydro plant to actually transmit uh, electricity to the grid. Uh, I believe that's, that's a commercial matter between CIMIC and, and uh, in this case, um, it would be, be SSE uh, as to the investment needed there. Um, so we don't believe there would be any direct impact or at least I'm certainly not aware of any. I'll ask my colleague Stuart Matheson just to, 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 to confirm if that's the case, in that there are individual contractual relationships between developers and, and the uh, distribution network operators as to uh, receiving grid capacity. So there's already an arrangement in place. So it would, if you like, those would trump any additional capacity that came in. They'd have to argue for that uh, separately with, with SSE and not eliminate the previous arrangements that there were for uh, existing sites in the area. So I don't believe there'd be an impact, but if I, with your forbearance, convener, if I maybe invite Stuart Matheson just to comment on that. Sure. Uh, so I guess our assumption would be that as part of that decision-making process, CIMEC would, um, would consult with the, the local network operator, which in this case, as the Minister said, is SSE Networks, as to the available grid capacity. And uh, and that that would be part of the, the decision making process. That um, the the assumption being that uh, for CIMIT to proceed with the project, that there would be sufficient grid capacity available for them to export additional energy. Uh, and so, in, in terms of impact of constraint payments, well, I guess it would depend on whether there were wind generators in the vicinity um, that may be competing for similar grid capacity. But I think our assumption would be that. Um, the SSE networks would only really support this particular project uh, if there was sufficient grid capacity for additional hydro generation and existing wind generation. If, if I might just add one point to, to Mr. Uh, Halker Johnson, that, that, that um, uh, obviously in the case of the Kinloch Leaven site, if it is upgraded, then primarily that power will be directed towards the, the smelter itself. It's obviously a, a very energy intensive process and therefore there's a, a high, uh, high you know, 
concentration of demand for electricity in that locality. So therefore, the occasions in which it's transmitting net electricity generation into the grid may be quite limited, and given the uh, certainly initially at least, given the, um, the its own needs for for electricity consumption. I suppose the issue would be if the if the smelter did not operate at some point in the future, then clearly there would be a an issue about unused uh, capacity locally having to be transmitted into the grid. But hopefully, we'll never reach that point. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Um, just one question for me: Is there a reason why this is was not done before? It's it's a it's a good question actually, Convener, because it's been raised a number of times by by individuals. I think who've queried why this particular provision was in place in the first place. Um, I think it was be fair to say that the derating of the plants was an unintended consequence of the original. Uh, legislative change uh, back in 2002, which was intended to um, allow uh, a strand of, of, of activity to take place that would help the uh, hydro uh, fleet owners actually in reinvest in renewing their estate. Uh, so the, the order actually helped unlock significant investment from SSE and, and Scottish Power in renewing their existing hydro fleet, uh, and therefore it, uh, it had a positive effect. But the unintended consequence was that several sites derated their capacity in order to come under the 20 megawatt threshold, and that meant that um, we've, we've arrived at the situation today where we've got this um, unfortunate barrier to them growing their output at a time when the world needs us to generate more renewable energy. So. It's a, uh, it's an odd, it's an odd anomaly. I think hopefully this this regulation will remove that anomaly and that uh, they will be able to operate on a level playing field with all other all other technologies. Right, thank you. Well, if there are no more questions from committee members, I'll we'll move to the formal debate and um, I'll invite the minister to formally move the motion. Formally moved, convener. Uh, does anyone wish to speak in the debate on the motion? Um, if not, we'll, I'll put the question. The question is that motion S5M14103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And finally, in light of timing, I'll invite the committee to agree that, uh, as convener, along with the clerks, I'll produce a short factual report of the committee's decision on this and arrange to have it published. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very convener. much. Thank you, committee. I'll now suspend the meeting.